Hello everyone, my name is Brian Beverly, and thank you for joining me for the School of the Prophets. This is a school, this is a class, and so get yourself a pen, get yourself a notepad, get into a quiet spot, and get ready to learn. And so Father, I pray that you would bless your people today as we talk about this strong gift called the prophetic. Let's get going. Okay, so we're going to spend about four classes on this subject. I could have done five, I could have done six, I could have done seven, but my goal is not to remove the Holy Spirit's influence from your life. At the end of the day, you've got to trust the Holy Spirit to prophesy. And sometimes, listen to me, sometimes we can learn and learn and learn. We take class after class after class. I mean, for some of you, this might be your third prophetic class. It might be your fourth prophetic class. And you just have got to get going. And so, wherever you're at coming to this video, I want you to trust the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that he's going to speak to you. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. Again, sometimes we get stuck with all our programs and we get stuck with all the teaching that we think to ourselves, we don't even need, we don't even need the Holy Spirit anymore. <laughs> that we learn so much that we can trust our own skills. And so I'm just going to do four classes and it's going to aid you in your ability, your spiritual insight to understand, to hear the voice of God. Jesus said that my sheep know my voice. And so it is a part of your right as a child of God. It is a privilege you have. You should be able to hear the voice of Almighty God speak to you right here, right now. And so that's all we're going to do is we're going to take time to tune into that voice. I'm going to give you some training here. I'm going to give you some teaching, maybe a little bit of preaching. I don't know, but I'm going to try to give you some tools to help you in your walk with God. And so there hasn't been enough training. There hasn't been enough equipping of the saints, as it says in Ephesians 4. That's what the fivefold ministry is supposed to do. And so I'm here j just to help you, once again, just to help you tune into that voice of God that you already hear. You might not just be accustomed to it yet. And so let's begin this way. I want us to understand that not everybody, listen to me carefully, not everybody is called to the office of prophet. That the office of prophet versus the prophetic gifting are two different things. That sometimes we hear the voice of God, we give someone a prophetic word, and we automatically think that we're a prophet. Baby, that's not the case. You have to be called into that office. You have to be established in that office from, from God. It's not just hearing from God. It's not just a prophetic gifting, but there's a disposition. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But let me just tell you what my concern is. My concern is that you would take a video like this and you would think that now I must be a prophet because I went through a class. I must be a prophet because God speaks to me, through me, to other people. And I don't want you to think that. Don't pick up the mantle of prophet if you are not called to the office of prophet. Now, everybody can give a word from God. Everybody hears from God. And so with that in mind, let's go, let's go forward. We're going to break down what the office is in a minute, but let's go forward to understand a definition. Let's think about what the office of prophet is. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. Leonard Ravenhill, he said, the prophets were people who walked with God. They felt like God. They saw like God. They wept like God. They yearned like God. Basically, a prophet is close to the heartbeat of God. The prophet lives really close to the principles, the desires, the purposes that God has for the earth. And so the prophet feels what God feels. Some people will say that God has no emotions. The reality is God does have emotions. They just aren't tainted like yours and mine are. We can be tainted by political stuff. We can be tainted by things going on down the street. We can have all sorts of things that mess up our emotions, things that have come against us. But God, who has emotions, they are not tainted by the world. And the prophet taps into that. And they say, thus says the Lord, the prophet can feel when God's angry. The prophet can feel when God is happy and, and jubilant. The prophet feels all these things when God speaks to them concerning different situations, di different circumstances and people. And so the prophet is almost like an open nerve, if you will, that they're opened up spiritually so much to God that they can sense him in almost everything. 
It's sort of like when you put your head up against someone's chest and you can hear their heart heartbeat. The prophet lives so close to the heartbeat of God. And so what is the disposition? What is the disposition of a prophet? If you're in the office of prophet, what is your disposition going to be? Because I need you to understand that the office of prophet is not a personality. Let me say that again. The office of prophet is not a personality. It is a disposition. And so what is disposition versus personality? Disposition is the arrangement, the placement, or the framework of how someone or something is inclined to perform under a given circumstance. Let me say that again and, and write that down. This position is the arrangement, placement, or framework of how someone or something is inclined to perform under a given circumstance. And so that's the disposition. Now, a personality is comprised of qualities relating to each person and a particular group. All right. And so this is what this is what this sounds like. Let me, let me explain this clearly to you. Once I give you a couple examples, you're going to understand what I'm saying. So let me give you this. A car is made to drive. That's the disposition, the arrangement, the placement, the framework. That's what a car does. A car is meant to drive. But some operators, listen to this, some operators will drive fast, slow, or reckless depending on who's in control of the steering wheel. That's the personality. Let me give you another one. All windows are made to see out of. All windows are made to see out of. That is the, the disposition. But some windows have white curtains or black curtains or, or orange curtains, green curtains, and that would be the personality. Do you see what I'm saying? And so for you to be in the office of prophet, there is a certain disposition one must have. It's not just a personality. You get some people sometimes and they think that, well, because I'm angry and because I tell it like it is and because I can see what nobody else sees and I'm the first one on the scene, you know, people get this thought and they think, well, I must be a prophet. No, no, you might just be critical. <laughs> That just because you have a big personality and a big attitude, it might not mean you're a prophet. It might mean you're just a bully. And so there's a certain disposition that a prophet, someone in the office of prophet has to have that is requisite for you to have these dispositions for you to be a prophet. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so understand being in the office of prophet, it is not a personality at all that you have some prophets and yes, they are introverted. They like to be by themselves. They get more energy when they're by themselves, reading a book, being at home, whatever the case may be. But you can also, listen to me, you can also have a prophet that is extroverted and they are a people person. They love to be around people. They talk about everything. They joke about everything. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so understand it. When we talk about the office of prophet, there is a disposition that's been given to the prophet by God himself. And so let's begin to break some of these things down. Not the personality, but the disposition. When you are dealing with someone in the office of prophet, they are truly, listen to me, they are truly future possessed. What do I mean by that? What I mean is they're constantly seeing a future in which God wins, and yet they're in a present reality, a present circumstance that does not reflect what they're seeing in the future. Did you catch what I just said? That the prophet is always future possessed. They're always future thinking. They're always leaning forward. And so understand, because of what they see in the future, they are actually the most hopeful of all the fivefold ministers. Let me say that again because people don't believe me. Because of what they see in the future, because they have a hopeful future in which God wins, in which God's bride is strong and vigorous and triumphant because they see all of that in the future. They are actually, in spite of popular opinion, they are actually the most hopeful of all the fivefold ministers. 
that typically when we think about a prophet, we think about Jeremiah and how he's the weeping prophet. We think about Elijah and how he's in the cave. And at one point he's at a tree and he wants to die. When we think about prophets, we tend to think that they're sad all the time. They're frustrated all the time. They're disappointed all the time. And yes, they have moments like that because of the burden in which they carry. But the reality is because of what they see in the future, future they are hopeful. But the problem is, stay with me, the problem is the people that are around them currently, the cities that they live in presently, they are corrupted or they don't see what they see. And so they're constantly trying to pull people forward to the hopeful future. And that's what makes them frustrated. Do you see what I'm saying? That Moses, he's hopeful. Moses says, says there's a promised land out there. Look, a land flowing with milk and honey. However, he's stuck with stiff-necked Israel. And he's just walking around the same old mountain. He's stuck with people that are complaining. And so Moses is actually hopeful. But he has to try to get these people that he's with to follow him to this place of joy. To this place flowing with God's abundance. Do you see what I'm saying? The prophet always sees God winning. They always see overcoming. They always see victory. They always see great triumph. They always see God and God's people standing tall and strong, but they're stuck in a situation oftentimes with people and different things going on in which they have to call those negative things out. They have to call those unrepentant things out. And so they seem like they're down, but they are actually very hopeful. And so they are future possessed. When you meet someone in the office of prophet, they're always ahead of their times. They're always coming up with things that other people don't think of. They're, they're sort of strange. They're sort of goofy. They're, they're different. And so they are future possessed. I remember when I was a kid. I was afraid of the car wash and I don't know what it was. You know, those automatic car washes where you drive up slowly and then you get pulled into the car wash and you got those spinners going really fast and there's water spraying all over the place and what have you. Well, as a child, I don't know how old I was. I was maybe like four, four or five years old. I used to think like in my imagination, I used to think that the car wash was like a monster and that those spinning wipes in there i thought that those were teeth and so <laughs> i thought it was like this monster that was going to eat me or grind me up or, or something like that and so i remember every time my mother would take us through the car wash in her car you know you know i would freak out and i would scream and i would go crazy and i would say oh my gosh what are you doing it what are we doing in here why is my mom doing this the car isn't that dirty we don't need to be in here and so watch this that seems silly, right? And it is silly for me to be, you know, thinking that it's going to eat me, thinking that the car wash machine is against me. But I was only four years old, only four or five years old, something, something like that. And so I didn't know, watch me, I didn't know what my mother knew, which is that once we got through this, the car was going to be shining, the car was going to be nice, it was going to feel good you ever you ever come out of car wash get in your car and all of a sudden you you, 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 know, you know you just feel good about it that you drove you drove to the car wash and your car was filthy it was dirty it was a mess next thing you know you, you drive it home and you, and you get out of it you look at it and you say wow this is this is clean this is nice this, this is wonderful right and so that's the prophet's dilemma is that is that they see this hopeful future and yet people don't see what they see. And so they're afraid to go forward. They're afraid to go through with what the prophet is saying. I was afraid to go through the car wash, even though my mom knew it was going to be fine. And that's how we are. Sometimes we're like children. Mm -hmm. That God will tell us something or give us a hopeful future or give us something for something for us to strive for. And we don't do it because we're not sure if we're going to come out on the other end okay. But the reality is, as believers, we need to trust the prophetic word that God has given to us. That, that if you're listening to me and you have a prophetic word given to you, if God's spoken something to you, if God told you what you ought to do, then baby, you need to go all the way through it. You need to follow through. Don't worry about a thing. Trust that God will get you through on the other side and that it's going to be victorious. It's going to be triumphant. Your God is a good God. We need to start believing whatever prophetic word we have over our lives. I'm telling you. 
I have prophetic words that are like, I don't know, maybe 12 years old, 13 years old now. And I'm just now starting to see them come to pass. Like I'm just now starting to see them come to pass. And I forgot about some of them, but now it's like, wow, when they said that 12, 13 years ago, I'm living it out today. You need to hold on to whatever prophetic promise is over your life and, and pursue it with all your mind. Trust God with it. And so the prophet is future possess, future possess. They see a hopeful future and they don't need everybody to agree with them. They would like it. The prophet would like it. They would like it. People would agree, would, would, would agree so they can just get on to the promised land. But they've seen something. And if people don't believe it, they don't believe it. They're going to keep on pursuing it. It's sort of like when you go to the gym and you have a fitness trainer. The fitness tra trainer looks at you, evaluates you, gives you a diet plan, whatever the case may be, gives you a workout plan, and they push you. Why? Because they see the, um, the end result. Now, at the beginning, you might think it's terrible. At the beginning, you might think, I don't want to do this. This fitness trainer is going to kill me. I ate too many fries last night. I shouldn't have had that milkshake. And now this fitness trainer is pushing me and pushing me, right? Why does the fitness trainer, trainer push you? Because they know that if you just get through the workouts and if you stick to the diet and if you keep a positive mindset, when you come out on the other side, you're going to be ripped. You're going to be healthy. You're going to have a good life and longevity, right? Just because you're healthy now. This is the case of the office of the prophet. They always see a great future, but they seem, they seem as if they are negative because they're constantly trying to pull people along with them that don't want to change. They don't want to sweat. They don't want to exercise. They don't want to start moving their feet. They don't want to pray. They want to hold on to their idols. They are rejecting God. Do you see what I'm saying? The office of prophet is always future possess. John the Baptist, what does he do? He points out the way, right? He's the forerunner of Christ. He's pointing out the way to, to repentance. He's pointing out the way to, to salvation. He says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That even though John was around a community of people that were sinful, community of people that rejected God, he still sees this hopeful future in which if we are baptized, right, for the remission of our sins, and we put our trust in Jesus, we will be saved. That's what the prophet does. They have a hopeful future. Even Isaiah when you read the writings of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, a lot of his writings, some of the things that he is saying, he's talking about Jesus. That he stuck all the way in the Old Testament. And yet, he sees this hopeful future of this Jewish man named Jesus coming on the scene eventually. And so when you are in the office of prophet, you won't just be someone that likes to give a word here and there. There's a future you see. There's a future you see, and this future, it could be for individuals, it could be for a region, a, a territory, a people group, whatever the case may be. And so when you're in the office of prophet, your disposition, you will be future possess. You will be thinking about the future all the time and what needs to be accomplished for God. Number two, they are burdened. Someone in the office of prophet, they truly have a, have a burden from the Lord. That you read Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 and it says this. Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came upon me. And then even Ezekiel, he would say the hand of the Lord was upon me. Now, understand, it is weighty for God's hand to be upon you. It is weighty for the word of the Lord to come upon you. We read that and we think, oh, that's nice. Oh, wouldn't it be great to hear from God? But to have God's hand on you, to have the word come to you. And to understand the story of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, right? How they had to give out these words and how, how they had to live a certain way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is a weighty matter to have God's word come upon you. To have his hand come upon, upon you. I don't think we understand that the way an Ezekiel or Jeremiah or, or Elijah did. And so it's a weighty matter. That when someone's in the office of prophet, God burdens them with something that he wants them to speak to. And even Jeremiah, he says that 
when he tries to hold on to God's word, stay with me, that when he tries to hold on to God's word and he doesn't want to speak out the word anymore because people are rejecting him, people are coming against him, people are trying to destroy his life. He says, even though I try to hold on to the word and I try to keep from speaking it, it becomes a fire in my bones. So Jeremiah says, if I give the word, I'm persecuted. If I hold on to the word, I feel like I'm persecuted. If I release the, the word, I'm in pain. If I hold on to the word, I'm in pain. If I release the word, I'm irritated. If I hold on to the word, I'm irritated. This is the disposition of the prophet. They are burdened with a task. They are burdened with a, with a word from God. They are burdened. They're feeling what God feels. They're sensing what God sense, senses. If God is angry at a nation, if God is angry with a community, if God is disappointed, if God is frustrated, the prophet has to feel all those emotions that are attached to the word that God has given to them to speak. Again, this isn't someone that that, that just gives a, a simple prophetic word uh, he, here and there. Someone who gives a prophetic word and, and you feel good about it. It doesn't seem to be too strenuous, strenuous, strenuous on you. This is someone in the office of prophet. It's a weighty matter. That even Nehemiah, that when he hears about the walls of Jerusalem being knocked down, he can't contain himself. He breaks down in tears. He prays. He cries out to God. He's burdened with this. And so he goes to the king and he says, can I go back to Jerusalem? I need to rebuild the walls, right? This is a weighty matter. They are absolutely burdened. I'll never forget some time ago, I was writing a sermon and I felt so burdened, like no joke. I was sitting there and, and I'm trying to get my sermon done and, and, it's, it's hard and I feel like the devil's coming against me. And I remember literally saying, devil, you're not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me from developing the sermon. I need, I need my clarity of thought. I need to be focused. Holy Spirit, help me. And you know what's funny? Is that I'm getting frustrated because usually I don't get tired when I'm writing sermons. Usually I don't feel so groggy when I'm trying to outline a message. But here's the funny thing. I was laying down on my bed. <laughs> here I am laying on my bed and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, the, the devil is coming against me. He's trying to keep me from focusing. He's making me tired and sleepy. But the reality is if I would just get up off my bed, if I wasn't laying down on my bed while trying to outline a message, I wouldn't be tired. See, sometimes we get into burdens. Things weigh us down because of the situation that we put ourselves in. I was only feeling tired during my sermon process because I was laying in a bed and sometimes you're tired sweetheart because of what you are doing because of who you are connecting with because you're in places that you should not be that sometimes the burdens that come into our lives it isn't the devil is not because God is doing it it's because we have put ourselves in situations that burden us but the prophet someone in the office listen to me their burden comes directly from God it's not just because of a circumstance. It's not just because you have haters on social media. It's not just because someone didn't, didn't invite you somewhere. It's not just because you're not having the right, you know, the, the right connections or what have you. It's not because you're, you're, you're vitamin deficient that you are burdened. No, the office of prophet, they are burdened because the word of the Lord, the hand of the Lord is upon them. And they had to release it. They had to do something. Someone in the office of prophet, they are often up. They're often grueling out what God is saying. And they're, they're saying to themselves, I've got to get this off me. I've got to get this off me. I've got to release the word. I've got to do something. Someone in the office of prophet is truly burdened by the Lord. You know, some people, they're, they're be on the internet, they're be on social media. You know, you have those keyboard warriors nowadays. They're just like typing books on social media, going at people, clapping back at people, going crazy, right? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes you get those people and they think that, whoa, I feel inspired by the Lord. No, 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 no. You just got frustrated by someone's social media page. 
You just got ignored by something you saw or something you heard. And you just felt like in your flesh that you needed to say something. But someone in the office of prophet, they could be minding their business. And they don't understand why they keep thinking about this situation. Or why this person keeps coming up in their mind. And they feel the burden of it. They weren't watching anything. They weren't looking for a word. But because they're in that office of prophet, God downloads something into them that needs to be released in the atmosphere. They have to speak. They have to correct. Whatever the case may be. They have to rebuke. They have to renounce. They have to call things out. That is the office of prophet. They truly are burdened by the Lord. They're not just frustrated with life or irritated with life because McDonald's forgot to give them their fries. Like, that's not what it is. All of a sudden, you get these Christians, they start rebuking McDonald's. Like, you didn't give me my fries. The Lord rebuked you. Like, so... <laughs> that's not the office of prophet. They are truly burdened by the Lord. Number three, they are called to a region that when you understand the office of prophet, they are called to a particular people, a particular group, a particular community, a particular setting, something like that. That when you look in the Bible, Jonah, he was called to Nineveh. He couldn't just run to wherever he wanted to, right? God said, go to Nineveh and drop this word on them. And so Jonah tries to run and God says, I got a big fish for you, boy. You ain't running. You can't just go anywhere and prophesy. You have got to go to Nineveh. And that's what some people don't understand. That when you're in the office of prophet, you have to be with a certain people. That God can send you different places, yes. But ultimately, when you're in that office, God will call you to a region. He'll call you to a people. He'll call you to a nation. Something like that. It will be evident that you are called to a certain people or a certain situation. That even Moses, he had to lead Israel. Moses couldn't be a deliverer for anybody. He had to be a deliverer for the nation of Israel. Elijah. Elijah tries to run from Jezebel. And he can't. God says, go back. Go back. Here's Elijah. He prophesies. He says, he says it's not going to rain, right? He's big and big bad for the Lord. He's, he's amazing. He's one of those gangsters for Jesus. Next thing you know, after he, after he dispatches of the prophets of Baal, Jezebel says, Oh, I want Elijah dead. And now he tries to run from his mission. He tries to run from his calling. And when God finds him out there in a cave, he says, look, you've got to go back to Israel. You can't run from this. See, one of the issues that we have in the church today is that you have somebody with a prophetic gifting. They, they have a prophetic gifting and they can move in the prophetic a little bit here and there. And so they go from one place to the next place to the next place and they assume that they're in the office. No, that's just a prophetic gifting. It's not the office per se. And listen, I'm going to explain this towards the end. I'm, I'm going to explain clearly so you understand the difference between someone in the office and someone who has prophetic gifting. But my point being is that when you're in the office, you are connected to a people. I mean, you can find prophets nowadays and they don't want to connect the churches. They don't want to be connected to any local body of believers. They call themselves a prophet. But where are you called to? What people? What church? Who's the apostle in your life? What, what church do you belong to? Do you see what I'm saying? Someone in the, in the true office of prophet, they are called to a people. They're called to a region. They're called to a territory. They're called to deal with certain situations. They just can't run. They just can't run. They are called to a place. And so number one, they're future possessed. Number two, they're, they're burdened. Number three, they are called to a region, called to a people. They're called to a church. Whether prophets like it or not, they are called to a church. Got to be with God's people. It's amazing. I, I'm saying that because I've met a lot of prophets that think I don't need to belong to a church. No, God tells us not to forsake the assembly, the assembly of the saints. That even in Ephesians 4, where, where it talks about the office of apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, it talks about that these offices are connected to the church, that they're there to equip the saints for ministry and to bring unity and love to the church, right? Etc. And so prophets are called to a people. They're called to a region. They may go different spots, and, and prophesy, right? Like Elijah, he finds the widow at a place called Zarephath. 
and he gives her a word, right? But he's still called to Israel. He's still called to deal with the problems going on in Israel. And so a prophet will be called to a region of people, those types of things. Prophets are lonely. Now, I know I said earlier on that it's not a personality type, that you can have a prophet that's extroverted or they can be introverted. But even if they're extroverted, listen to me, even if the prophet is extroverted and they have a lot of contacts in their phone and they're a social butterfly and they call a bunch of people, they will still deal with loneliness. They will deal with loneliness. See, here's what you got to understand. I call it the I don't care anointing. <laughs> I, I just don't care anointing. God makes his prophet lonely on purpose. That even though you can have a prophet that's extroverted, they will still have to find time alone. They will still have to get alone with God. And even though they're with a group of people, they will still feel lonely. Why? Why is that? Because God wants to make sure that his prophet, his mouthpiece, his, his spokesman is not tainted nor manipulated by the people around him. Not manipulated by the people around him or her at all. And so you often find that a prophet is lonely. That even God, he tells Jeremiah that he can't go to celebrations. He can't go to weddings. He can't, he can't do anything like that. He has to find God in the loneliness of his life. And so what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the true office of prophet, they are holy. Now understand, we get three words mixed up and we think they're, we think they're the same thing, but they're not. That we think that goodness and, and righteousness and holiness, holiness are the same thing, but they're not. Let me explain it. Good means to be kind. When we say that someone's good, what we're saying is, is that they're kind. They're benevolent. They do kind acts. They are a kind-hearted person. Good means kind. When we talk about righteousness, what we're talking about is right standing, doing things right, justice, those things. But when we talk about holiness, we're talking about loneliness. All right. When we talk about holiness, we're talking about loneliness or here's the best, better way to understand it. Separation. That holiness means to be separate, separate from the world, separate from secular ideas and norms. The prophet, listen to me, is extremely holy. They are separated. Their holiness is the result of loneliness. Their holiness is the result of loneliness. They they end up being with God a lot. And that's where they want to be. That's where they find their peace. Again, the prophet can be extroverted and they can enjoy small talk. They can enjoy people. But ultimately, where they feel the most peace, the most joy is in the presence of God. They love the presence of God. And so if you're in the office of prophet, your disposition will be one of loneliness. You can't always connect with people. And God does that to you on purpose because then you won't be manipulated. You won't be manipulated. You are come forth and you preach that word with boldness and with clarity and with a sharpness. And you won't worry about what people think about you. You won't care if they reject you. You won't care if they push you away. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That sometimes when you're really close to people, you don't say certain things because you don't want to hurt them. And so God makes sure that the prophet has this, I don't care anointing. <laughs> this, I don't care anointing that I love people and I love God, but I'm going to say what God wants me to say. And so they, they will be lonely that if you have a pastor, listen to me, if you have a pastor, that's really a prophet, you will notice that, that they don't really like to talk that much. They may talk, right? They may talk, like especially if it's an extroverted uh, prophet who's disguising themselves as a pastor, right? Or they're or they're a prophet and they're called to pastor a church. They they may they may be able to talk, right? But ultimately, typically, when you have a prophet as your pastor, they tend to like to be alone. They don't do the typical pastoral stuff, right? You may notice that that uh they might be awkward in conversation, whatever the case may be. That you can again, you can have a prophet that's a pastor of a church, and they are like social butterflies, but it's limited. It's limited, and you know it. <laughs> they can talk, and you see, you see, when you're an introverted prophet, you struggle to talk just in general. Like you're you're getting it from double double sides. Like you're you're introverted and you're a prophet. So 
you're you're naturally not wanting to talk, be around people. You get drained by people and now you're a prophet so god intentionally makes you lonely so that you can experience his voice and have clarity with him and not worry about people so you're getting it double but you might be one of these prophets who pastors a church and you're extroverted and the reality is you're limited in your conversation and you know it because you're going to go back to loneliness with god because god wants you to be completely his he, he wants to make sure that you hear his voice and you don't worry about what people think Number five, they are righteous. The disposition of a prophet, their framework. Again, remember, remember the definition of a, the, the, the definition of the disposition, right? Their framework, their placement, their arrangement, their disposition is that they are righteous. When you are, are around a prophet, they believe in living right. They have to. They have to because they're around the presence of God. That that in the Old Testament, when the priests would go into the Holy of Holies, when they were in the presence of God, if they were sinful, if they did anything blasphemous, they would drop dead in the presence of God. Now, the prophet who lives who, who lives very close to the heart of God, who lives very close to the to the mind of God, they practice righteousness, not just because they fear the Lord, but because they really love him. And they understand how precious God's presence is. And so they, and so they, and so they live righteous lives and understand this. Listen to me, just because you're offended doesn't mean that you're right. Let me say that again. Woo! Just because you are offended, that doesn't mean that you are right. That sometimes life manipulates us. Sometimes we have past experiences that have not been covered by the blood yet. We have not practiced forgiveness yet. Therefore, sometimes we get offended and we're not right. We get offended by politicians. We get offended by our neighbors. We get offended by someone down the street. We get offended because somebody didn't notice us. We get offended because somebody didn't call us. We get offended because we thought somebody should have said hello to us or they bumped us on accident and they didn't say and, and they didn't say sorry. They didn't mean to do it, but you take it personally. We can get offended for all the wrong reasons. And just because you're offended doesn't mean that you're right. But when the prophet gets upset about something, it's because of righteousness that the prophet looks and says, something's wrong. God is not honored. God is not glorified. Why aren't people righteous? That some Christians, listen to me. This is one of the best ways I can explain it. Some Christians, they get upset because they have the heart of God now, right? They've been transformed. They have a renewed mind. They have a renewed mind, right? They have different passions. Some Christians get upset then when people are treated poorly. Because they love God. And so, uh, and so a, a typical Christian will say, I love God and people should not be treated that way. That people and made in God's image just like me, they should be loved, they should be cared for. That's what a typical Christian is going to say because we love God and we love people. That's the greatest commandment. But the prophet, listen, listen to the difference. It's a small nuance, but, but it's a big one. Small nuance, but it, it points to a big point. The prophet, however will be frustrated over other people because they hurt God directly. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That the typical Christian, they say, when people get hurt, that when, when people get hurt, that's wrong because God called us to more. But the prophet goes a step forward and they say, a step forward and they say, how dare you insult God by doing that? That they don't only like it being done to the people, but they think, do you realize how much you're coming against the God that I love? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see the difference? Do you see the nuance that as a typical Christian, you say as Christians, it's wrong to treat people that way. But the prophet says it's wrong that you're doing this to God, that what you do to people is a direct assault to my God. And so the prophet stands up in boldness and righteousness and, and says, repent, stop trying to hurt God. Now you can't really hurt God. God, God, God is, is, is alpha and omega. He's, he's mighty. He's the first and the last. But in my limited human vocabulary, that's the best way I can describe it. Number six, they carry the presence of God. And here's what I mean by that. When you go to Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah has this beautiful vision of God seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe fills the temple. And, and Isaiah, he sees 
the angels, the seraphim, and how with two wings they covered their faces with two, they covered their feet, and with two they fly. And these angels, they're crying out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says, says that the temple shook, right? The threshold shook. It's a powerful, powerful Im image. And Isaiah falls to his knees, at least that's how I imagine it. He falls to his knees and he says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. And so watch this. From that vision that Isaiah has in Isaiah chapter 6, doesn't that draw us into the presence of God? Doesn't it make us say, whoa, and wow, incredible. Here's Isaiah, and he sees God on a throne, high and exalted. And then we even have Moses, that he would go to the tent of meeting, and he would spend time with God. And your Bible says, watch this, that as Moses was heading to the tent of meeting, the other Israelites, they would come out of their tents, they would stand by their doors, and they would begin to worship God. So watch this. They would look at Moses heading to the tent of meeting to do what? To worship God. And so they looked at Moses, but they thought of God because they too would begin to worship. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That there was something about Moses going to that tent of meeting to worship God. And when that cloud would come down, that it caused everybody else to worship. It caused everybody else to wonder and be in awe at the presence of God. The prophet brings the presence of God wherever they go. When a prophet is there, when the office is truly there, the atmosphere will be charged up. You feel like something's about to happen. You feel the anointing. You feel God's presence. You feel like there are seraphim, like there are angels present right now. Number seven, they carry offices. Let me say that again. Number seven, the true office of prophet, they carry other offices. And what I mean by that is the fivefold offices, the apostle, the prophet, the, the, the pastor, the evangelist, and the teacher. That when you look in the Bible, David becomes king. Why? He becomes king once, once Samuel shows up. Once Samuel shows up. That the prophet Samuel shows up and he anoints David and all of a sudden he becomes, he, he becomes the, the, the future king of Israel. And we even see that with Elijah and Elisha. That Elisha, he's just taking care uh, of, of flocks, right? He works out in fields. Next thing you know, the prophet Elijah shows up, throws his mantle on him and says, look, you're going to be a prophet like me. Let's get training. And so what I'm saying is someone in the office of prophet has the ability to activate, has the ability to anoint people for other offices. They anointed them as kings back in the, back in the old covenant, right? They, can, they, they, they anointed other prophets. And so when a prophet is around, they might prophesy to you something that you never heard before. They might call you an apostle. They might call you a prophet. They might call you a teacher, or evangelist, whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden from them prophesying that word, it activates something in your life. That David had no idea he was going to be the king of Israel until Samuel showed up and, and prophesied it in his life. Number eight, they carry blessings. Prophets carry blessings. There's something in the Bible that's referred to as the prophet's reward. And people make a lot out of that, that when you receive a prophet, that you get a prophet's reward. And people try to say that it might be this or it might be that. We're not sure what the reward is, but the point being is the Bible goes out of its way. God's, God goes out of his way to say that when you bless a prophet, when you receive a prophet, there's a reward attached to it. That even Elijah, when he goes to Zarephath, he tells the widow that if she wants to survive, if if she and her child want want to live, just 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 bless me. Give me that last cake, right? That's what Elijah says. Don't you don't have to feed your child. You you don't have to try to take care of your child. Just give me that last cake, and then and then the flour, the oil, it will never run out, right? And so she blesses Elijah, and in turn, as a as a result of her blessing Elijah, she receives a blessing in the midst of a famine. And, and what's interesting is that out of all the other offices, that the prophet is the only one that mentions a reward directly. That when you bless a prophet, you get a, you get a reward when you receive a prophet. So there's something about this office of prophet. Because they are so close to the heart of God, it's very important. Like even, even the Bible says, do my prophets no harm. Why does God say that? Because they are his mouthpiece. God lets the prophet into the Holy of Holies 
in a way that even the priest didn't get to go. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That when we look at the mountain of transfiguration, there are two prophets up there, two prominent prophets that we're looking at, uh, Elijah and Moses. Up there on the mountain of transfiguration with prophet Jesus, that's where the prophets live. They get to go deeper into the presence of God. They, they get to see things. They get to hear things from God. And so because they are so close to the heart of God, because they are so precious to God, there's a blessing attached to them when you bless a prophet, when you receive them. Okay. And so what is the difference between prophetic gifting and the office of prophet? Well, the office of prophet is, is those things that I listed. That does, that's not everything, but that is their disposition. All right. But prophetic gifting, let me say it this way. I have an illustration that I like to use, and this really helps people understand that when you leave your home. Let's say you're married. You have a, a wife and kids or whatever the case would be. You have a husband and kids. And let's say that you and your spouse, you want to go out for a night on the town. And so what do you do? You get a babysitter. And when you get a babysitter, they are not the parent. They're not you, but they do have some of your authority. That before you leave the house, you, 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 you tell them emergency num numbers. You tell them... Uh, different things about your children, what they need and, and, and when they need it. And you give them some, some authority to discipline. Maybe you tell them that you, that, that, that they can put them in timeout or whatever, but they are still not you, the parent. And so they have limited, listen to me, the babysitter has limited authority. They have limited gifting, right? To run your house. So if you come home from your night out on the town and you discovered that while you were gone, the the babysitter had a party and, and invited somebody to your house that you didn't know about. That's going to be a problem, right? Because they're acting with just some of your authority. They don't have all authority because you and your spouse are the parent. When you're in the office, you are a parent. You have more authority. Uh, there's an anointing there. Uh, there there's, there's strong gifting there. But when you are operating with a prophetic gifting, you're more like the babysitter. That you can operate with some of the gifts and you can give words of knowledge and you can give uh, words of wisdom and you can prophesy, but it doesn't come with the same authority. For example, you're not activating. If you're in the place of the babysitter, then you're just sort of taking care of what's already there. So when you give a prophetic word, it's not going to be like activating someone into an office. It's just going to be uh, more so nurturing and, and for edification, uh, comfort. Those types of things. But when you're in the office of prophet, you're the parent. And so you come home and you tell your kids how to live. And you're trying to get them uh, established in life and get them onto their careers, right? You give them some direction for, for where they can go to college, all that stuff. But the point being is that God does put people in the office for a particular re reason. And when someone's in the office of prophet, they have this disposition. They have the grace to be in that position. They can handle the burden. When people try to step into the prophetic office and they aren't really called there, they just have prophetic gifting, then they have problems. Then people get hurt. Then people get devastated. Then we start prophesying in realms and areas that we ought not to be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That when you think about this example, again, with the, with the babysitter versus the parent, the parent is the one that can do discipline. That if I came home and I discovered that the babysitter got a belt and was like whipping my children, I would think, what are you doing? Like, uh, like, no, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I didn't hire you for that. Now, if I told them that they can put them in timeout, that would be one thing. Or take away a toy, that'd be one thing. But you shouldn't be spanking my kids as the babysitter. Do you see what I'm saying? So someone in the office of prophet, they will do discipline. They will do strong correction. They will do direction. But someone who has prophetic gifting, you shouldn't be doing strong discipline like that. You shouldn't be telling people to pack up and move to some other place. You can bring comfort. You can bring edification. Those types of things. What I want you to do before the next video is to live with a burden for at least a week. What I mean by that is I want you to pray for a week for your community, for a neighbor, something like that. Look on the news, talk to your neighbors. What are they going through? And I want you to take a whole week or, or, or at least until we meet again on this video. And I want you to pray for that person. How would you pray for, for that person, your community? 
as if it was going to affect you. Hmm? That if it, it that if it was your niece or or your daughter or your son, how would you pray for that person? If it was your spouse, right? And so look at the community around you, and I want you to live with that burden until we meet again here on video. All right, be blessed. See you next time. Peace out, y'all.